Hello, I'm Dr. Ashley Keita, an assistant professor in the Department of Head and Neck Surgery here at UCLA. I'm excited to talk to you today about when to consider procedural options for obstructive sleep apnea. Obstructive sleep apnea, or OSA, is the most common form of sleep apnea. This is where air encounters a blockage somewhere between the lungs and nose and mouth. If you don't get enough air while sleeping, it makes sense that you don't sleep well. This also places stress on your heart and lungs as they work to deliver less oxygen to your tissues. If untreated, individuals with moderate or severe OSA have a high risk of cardiovascular disease, such as abnormal heart rhythm, heart attack, or stroke. Other risks include diabetes, depression, and even car accidents. OSA is very common. It affects 12% of United States adults, according to the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. But they estimate that only one in five people with OSA have been diagnosed, which means up to 60% of the United States population may actually have OSA. Common symptoms include tiredness, snoring, and waking up short of breath. Please talk to your primary care doctor if you think you might have sleep apnea. They'll often ask some screening questions, such as whether you snore, frequently nap, or are tired during the day. They'll also consider things such as your height, weight, neck size, blood pressure, age, and gender to decide if you need to be tested for OSA. Testing is simple. This is done with a sleep study. A sleep study measures your heart rate, oxygen levels, and breathing effort while you sleep. You can do a sleep study at home or in a sleep lab. My lab is even developing a way to diagnose sleep apnea using just thermal imaging and near-infrared sensors. If an individual is diagnosed with OSA, some initial treatment options can include continuous positive airway pressure, which is a mask that blows air to relieve the site of obstruction, regardless of where it's located. Other options include weight loss, sleeping in more favorable positions, and mouthpieces that can help to create more space at the back of the throat for air to move. But these don't work for everyone. And when initial treatment options don't work, we should explore other options rather than just accepting the long-term risks of OSA. This is where procedural options come in. These really come down to addressing the site where the blockage and airflow is occurring. As otolaryngologists, also known as ear, nose, and throat physicians, we examine the airway to help determine the site of obstruction. If the obstruction's in the nose, we have procedures to help you breathe better through the nose. If you have large tonsils, such as the person in the image on the upper right, removing those can often cure sleep apnea. If the problem is that the tongue slips back during sleep and crowds breathing, then there are procedures to help the tongue stay in a more forward position, either permanently or dynamically, such as with hypoglossal nerve stimulation. Hypoglossal nerve stimulation is what's depicted here, and it's an implant that moves the tongue forward every time someone takes a breath at nighttime. But every individual is different, which is why formulating a tailored approach with customized surgical procedures is important. My undergraduate training was in biomedical engineering, and I love to help my patients explore the mystery of why they're having obstructions when they sleep. At UCLA, we are curious. I'm part of a wonderful sleep apnea surgical division that helps patients with obstructive sleep apnea. We do research and explore the answers to questions on behalf of our patients. We keep up with current techniques and outcomes so that we can counsel our patients well. We teach and are committed to learning. We want OSA patients to understand their options so that together we can find the best way to help them with their obstructive sleep apnea and to live long, full, happy lives.